So now we have Victor telling us about terms of non commutative analytic functions. Thanks, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation, and thanks for the happy few remaining <laughs> to Paul Shakespeare. Uh, so we heard in several talks throughout the last three days that non commutative polynomials or non commutative rational functions can be profitably viewed as functions on the tables of matrices and profitably from two directions, profitably from the point of view of studying those tables of matrices, because it entails that we can do some kind of geometry, some varieties, etc. But also profitably from the point of view of free algebra, because if we view something as a function, it allows us to do things. Uh, so what I want to do, I want to go more in the direction of NC, NC stands for non-commutative, or free non-commutative function theory. So I want to start by introducing those functions of the non-commuting variables, of which polynomials are rational functions, or non-commuting rational functions are prototypes. Uh, and the idea here, so going from commutative functions to non-commutative functions, is an idea that has been prominent in a few other places in mathematics, that we go from objects to matrices over those objects. Uh, so it's the same, so it's been done in functional analysis in operator space theory, it's been done in free probability, in a sense it's been done in free algebra, in the world of PMCon, etc. And I would call, I usually call it quantization, but maybe there are still some physicists left, so I know that that will be taking Lord's name in vain, which I think was punishable by hanging in this colony. Are you referring to rounding, Victor? Hmm? <laughs> are you referring to rounding? Or hmm? Rounding. Or are you... No. 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 Okay, so let me give a general definition, then I'll kind of specialize to uh, uh, more concrete situations. So, Let's be the vector space over that's it. It's not really the matter. And then I define the non-commutative space over V to I just take square matrices over V of all sizes. That is the joint you can. And then in this kind of graded set, in this graded object. I introduce, so a subset is called an NC set if it is closed with respect to direct sums. So direct sums are kind of the most natural operations here. So if we take x and y in omega, so x is let's say an n by n matrix, y is an n by n matrix, and I want this to imply that uh, x direct sum y, which is just this block, is you know corresponding such. Okay, so that's the domains, and what are the functions? So if we take, if I take omega is an NC set, then f from omega two matrices over another vector space, W, is called NC function if it is graded. So n by n matrices, omega n is the part of omega that lies at 11 n, so n by n matrices go to n by n matrices. And f preserves direct sums. So if x and y are in omega, then f of x plus y equals f of x plus y. And f preserves similarities. I mean, if we have a matrix over a vector space, we can multiply it on the left or on the right by a matrix of numbers, right? By model, if you wish. So f 
of S X S inverse equals S F of X S inverse. And here we have to be a little bit careful because most domains that one actually considers are not invariant by the similarities, but let's say in this generality, so I take X is an omega N, S is an invertible N by N matrix, and I assume that S, X, S inverse is still the domain. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's the axioms. Uh, in a moment, I will, I will specialize, but uh, and I think the definition was briefly mentioned in Scott's talk. Uh, and uh, let me just mention that this theory goes back to the work of Joseph L. Taylor in the early 1970s, and then it kind of lay dormant for uh, almost 30 years, and then it took again in the 2000s. Uh, there has been some work by Kulesko in the early 2000s, and then the subject became quite active in the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, there's a monograph by Dmitry Kalukin, Rokovetsky, and myself, who are kind of developing the system. I bring myself to the case when V is a finite dimensional vector space, CD, and uh, of course, if you think about it for a second, then an n by n matrix over CD is just the t-tuple of n by n matrices, right? So this is really the same thing as t-tuple of n by n matrices. So my functions on every level go from t-tuples of n by n matrices to n by n matrices. They preserve direct sums and they preserve simultaneous similarity. Okay, so what are the examples? So your W is just going to be C, or? My W is going to be C, yeah. Okay. Which means that on level N, yeah, I should have written it down. Uh, so at level N, I go from here to C and back. Uh, so examples. And I guess I should mention that when I will get to the topic of my talk, after the introduction, which hopefully will not take the whole time, that the, my talk, the actual work on the local theorem, the churns, in joint work with uh, the theory. Okay, so examples. So the first example that we saw quite a bit are non commutative polynomials. If we have a non-commuted polynomial, like x1, x2, times x2, x1, a very nice non-commuted polynomial, then it gives us an NC function that will, it's globally defined, the domain is everything, and it will just send the pair x1, x2, x1, x2, minus x2, x1, okay, it's identically zero on level one, never mind. The polynomial is uniquely determined by the function if you look at all the levels, because there are no polynomial identities that are valid for matches of all sizes. Another example that was also discussed quite a bit are non commutative rational functions. It's a very nice non commutative rational function. And this will. Okay, well, it's not everywhere defined. That's what it does. Inverse the commutator. So it's defined on the subset of all pairs of matrices x1, x2, of all sizes, so that the commutator is invertible. This is obviously an NC set. And uh, that's what it does. Now, of course, this is not a non commutative rational function, this is a non commutative rational expression. And as was discussed uh, in the first day, maybe also afterwards, uh, we 
two non-commutative rational expression define the same function, the same non-commutative rational function, if they're evaluation equivalent. So the function here is actually well defined. Okay, we have to be a little bit careful about the domain, but this can be sorted out. Okay. Uh, Then, if we want to move beyond pure algebra, the next thing to consider are non-commutative power series. So, so for instance, we can take something like 1 plus x1 plus x2 plus x1 squared plus x1 x2. One, square, etc. And now here we have to be a little bit careful with evaluation. So if we actually want to have a function, so we can one thing that we can do in non-commutative setting that we cannot do in the commutative setting, we can take an arbitrary non-conversion power series and make it into a function, an honest to God function, by evaluating on joint the important tuples of matrices. So matrices which are, in some choice of basis, strictly upper triangular. Uh, so there it will always converge, because it will be a finite sum. So that's one purely algebraic way. So this can be defined on jointly important tuples of matrices. Or if we have a series which is at whose coefficient to NC power series on a small NC ball around. Zero. Yes. So for NC polynomials, these X1 is a tuple of matrices. No, so X1 is a single matrix, X2 is a single matrix. So the point is that a, a matrix over C2 is the same thing as a pair of is a pair of matrices over C, right? If you think about it. So if you have a net by a matrix of vectors in C2, you can really view it as two matrices over C. Okay. So that's an element in the domain, x1 and x2 are just complex matrices, and the function maps such a pair to such a single matrix. Oh, okay. okay? And likewise here, except that operations are more general, likewise here, except we have to be careful about convergence. Okay, so now if uh, we think of function theory on uh, the then in the classical case, power series is locally all there is, and then we obtain general analytic functions by analytic continuation. And, and if we want this to be a good function theory, as it eventually turns out to be, uh, it's kind of amazing that those simple axioms, which are sort of obvious, almost obviously necessary, it's not very hard to convince yourself that if you want a function on all levels that somehow comes from some global object that's better satisfy those restrictions. But what is amazing is that those two restrictions actually lead to meaningful theory. And this was tremendous insight of Taylor in his uh, magnificent uh, paper in paper in advances in uh, 1972, I think. Uh, so anyway, uh, if we want here to have a similar situation, then non-commutative power series are not quite enough because non-commutative power series, well, they are on zero, and of course you can shift the origin. But the problem is they can only shift the origin by scalar. So if you have a guy like that, that is not regular, that is not defined anywhere on level one, you are in trouble because there is no no center around which you can expand it. Well, that's not quite true, because there are metric centers, and that leads us to the next point, which is really special to the non-commutative case, and that's uh, power series around the metric center. So, uh, 
So well, series around a matrix center. Why? here is going to be a certain double of S by S matrices. So S is 1. This is kind of the usual case in fluid scalar center. And then we just have the usual non-commuted power series where X, X1 is just shifted, where Xs are just shifted by Y. And then if we go to matrices, then we just shift a 2 by 2 matrix by scalar matrix. Uh, but it also could be a gen, S could be also greater than 1. Okay, so let me write down something and then try to explain uh, what it is. So, I want to write the following thing. The first Taylor is Brook Taylor of calculus, and the second Taylor is Joseph L. Taylor. Then our multilinear maps. Times the two one element, right? 
So it will be x, 1, 2, tensor x, 2, 1, etc. etc. Et so I will get this matrix, right? This is the 1, 1 element. Now, what is F2? F2 is a bilinear map from CS. Uh, sorry, this should be the C. Is a bilinear map. The, uh, but of course, a multilinear map is the same as a linear map on the tensor product. So I can think of it alternatively as a linear map from the tensor product of two copies of this space to S base matrices. So what I do now, and that's the meaning of this coefficient, I simply apply, so I have now a two by two matrix over CSS to the D, tensor CSS to the D, and I now hit F2 on every element of this matrix. And I get an S by S matrix. So in general, this, is a, I take a CSS to the D and I have an M by N matrix over that. I do the matrix multiplication, the ones that our undergraduate algebra students hate with so much passion, at least mine. I do it in the tensor algebra. So once I do this multiplication, which has a horrible name of four product in operator space theory, which is very derogatory towards a product to call it false. But. So you will get a matrix over CSS D to the tensor power L of size M by M, right? Because this was an M by M matrix over this space. This is M by M matrix over the L tensor power of this space. And now you hit every entrance, every entry of this matrix by this multilinear map L, you will get an M by M matrix over this. So therefore you get an SM by SM matrix. Okay, so that's the meaning of this series. Uh, in a second I will... I will, I, will, I will say something about convergence issues because, of course, we still have infinitely many terms, so we still need to worry about convergence. Uh, but the point is, before we get to convergence, before we get to analysis, there is an algebraic issue here. And the algebraic issue here is that, okay, this is a legitimate object, yeah, provided we can sum it up, but this object will not necessarily be an NC function. It's pretty obvious from the way it is defined that it will respect direct sums. Because you just see it's kind of built in. It is also obvious that if you add by a similarity, which is identity on S by S matrices, so you take an S by S identity tensor with any M by M invertible matrix, this will pull out. This is also clear. This is just uh, the way the definition was written. But of course, we want our NC functions to respect similarities of any SM by SM matrix. And while for the case S equals 1, by the way, for the case, for the case S equals 1, we just get back, so this will be uh, just an L linear mapping from L copies of CD to C, and once you expand it, along the standard basis, you just get the usual longitudinal power series, so we just get back the same object. So anyway, in the case of a metric center, there are additional conditions that those coefficients should satisfy. So FL have to satisfy so-called intertwining conditions with respect to the center y. So that's an infinite series of conditions on these multilinear map maps FL, which involve the center y. I am not going to write all of them, I'll just write the first two. So S F0 minus F 
zero s equals f one s y minus y s. So here s is an arbitrary s by s matrix. So f zero l equals zero. This is just an s by s matrix. I take its commutator with an arbitrary matrix s, and it has to give the same value as f1 evaluated on this decouple. y is the center. And then the next condition is that s f1z minus f1 sz equals f2 of sy minus ysz and f1cs minus f1 Z S equals F two of Z S Y minus Y S, and this is true for all Z in the space analysis, etc. etc. So it somehow has got to do with uh, we still would like to have a more clear algebraic picture of those conditions and some kind of bimod bimodule structure of d tuples of matrices under the left and right actions. Somehow there is a derivation cribbing in here, but uh, 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 the condition somehow don't, so far, we don't have a clear algebraic understanding of them. But these are necessary and in some sense necessary and sufficient conditions for those on those coefficients so that you get an NC functions, and once you have these, then uh, you indeed we are, we can go with Weierstrass, so so uh, okay, now we, we have to assume something about convergence, of course. So uh, let me do not dwell too much on it. So uh, ass uh, assuming that uh, the completely bounded norms, so FL are multilinear mappings, uh, we can talk about their completely bounded norms and assume that they are completely bounded, bounded norms grow it most exponentially, so lean soup L fruit of this is finite. Uh, this defines an MC function on a small, on a non commutative ball around our center y. And as I said, now we are kind of in Weierstrass world. Conversely, that's the regularity theorem of NC function theory uh, given uh, uh, NC function. Bounded on a NC ball around Y, it can be expanded uh, in such power series. And the coefficients are the so-called different differential operators of f at the point y. So uh, there are there is quite a bit of things that are implicit here. So these NC functions, and this is kind of purely corollary of these algebraic conditions of respecting direct sums and similarities, admit a good difference differential calculus, so you can actually consider their der derivatives. And then 
there is a miracle, like in usual complex analysis, we assume that we have, I don't know, a distributional solution of the Cauchy Riemann equation, and then it's automatically a smooth function that can be expanded to power series. Similarly, here, we assume a very weak regularity condition, we assume just boundedness. Uh, in the appropriate topology, and then it follows that the function is actually analytic on every level, but even more, it can be expanded in this NC constants. Okay, and now I can... How much time do I have, by the way? Okay, great. So now I can finally start my talk. So the goal of what I want to talk about is... Uh, Uh, so what do we get? We obtain rings of the ring of germs uniformly analytic function at center y or around y or in the neighborhood of y. OY uniform analytic. Uniform analytic has to do with the choice of various topologies on those non-computer spaces. Uniform means that we kind of take uniform balls in all dimensions, uh, which we have identified with the ring of those power series of this type with this uh, growth restriction on the coefficients, and the coefficients have to satisfy those canonical intertwining conditions that are remain. And uh, we want to understand these rings. Uh, so in the remaining, I know it's less than 15 minutes, let me tell you a few words about what we, have been able, what we can prove. So there is a sharp dichotomy uh, between the cases of the scalar center and the cases of the matrix. So in case S equals 1, and then we can really shift, and we can make, may as well assume that our point Y is the origin. We are just looking at the ring of locally convergent NC power series. This is a domain. And uh, the most natural thing that we can ask about domains in both commutative and non-commutative situations is how we can look at their maps to skew fields. Uh, so, what we can attempt to do, we can attempt to, to do the same thing that we did with polynomials when we constructed rational functions. So we can start with elements of O0 and uh, apply arithmetic operations and what we get we get rational expressions in uh, well, uniform analytic and functions or germs around zero. That we call neuromorphic expressions. How you construct the remote functions, right? In visual complex analysis. And now we can play the same game. We can
Okay, any such neuromorphic expression will have a domain, possibly it will be an empty domain, so we're going to exclude things like x1 minus x1 to inverse. So we get an uh, equivalence relation. on non-degenerate neuromorphic expressions. Uh, and we get a ring. Ring of germs of uniformly, or maybe ring of, let's say, uniformly analytic and suggests Okay, so that's a ring. Yes. Could you say what a germ is? It's okay if it's like a cartoon definition for that. Yeah, well, a germ means that you identify functions which are equal and special to small nickel. Oh. So for analytic functions, that just means that you're looking at power series expansion. Right. For continuous functions, it's strict, right? So it means re really that we are only interested in the local theory. Local theory in sufficiently close to the point one. Okay, so then there are two main theorems. One is that this is actually a skew field. Uh, notice that this means something very concrete. It means that if you take a germ M and if you assume that its determinant, the equivalent class of germs, is zero for all X, right? Then this implies that it's actually zero. Right, because if a germ is not identical to zero, we can invert it, and we still will get a germ, right? Because that was the definition. I, I, I applied arithmetic operations as long as I had non-degenerate neuromorphic expression. Non-degenerate means that it's defined somewhere. So I can invert as long as it's not identical to zero. Uh, as long as it's as its determinant is not identically zero. So to say that it is a skew field so that any non-zero element is invertible is the same as to say that if determinant vanishes identically of a meromorphic expression, then so does the meromorphic expression itself. And that's already a non-trivial statement for even for non-commutative polynomials. Certainly for non-commutative rational functions, the proof here is not much harder than in that case. Now, in the non-commutative, in the commutative case, kind of, if you have a domain, and if you embed it in a, in, a, in a field, and if it generates that field, that's it, right? Because the field of fractions is unique. In the non-commutative case, this is very far from being the case, but there is the notion of the universal skew field of fractions, which is implicit, I guess, in the work of an on rational identity, on rational identities, and was made explicit in a grand way uh, by P.M. Kahn in, uh, in his life work over uh, many decades. So the second theorem is that this Q field is the universal Q field of fractions of our uh, now, my time is very soon is going to be negative. As Laurent Schwartz once said during his talk, once you went 20 minutes late, but minus 20 is a perfectly good real number. So, <laughs> we don't want to get there. Uh, so, question. So yeah. Can you say what is the relation of this field to the PSQ field? Well, it's much bigger. So, it's... Uh, it bears this Q field relates to convergent NC power series the same way 
as the free skew field relates to the free algebra. So it's the analog, it's the exact analog for the ring of convergent NC power series. It plays exactly the same role that the free skew field plays for the free algebra. And I certainly don't have time to define what it means. Let me just say kind of two corollaries, uh, which uh, things which more or less follow from here and more or less equivalent to that. One is assume we had a morph a homomorphism phi from our ring to any stably finite algebra, A. Uh, stably finite means that if a matrix, a matrix over the algebra is right, right invertible, then it's also left. Uh, and, okay, now we can take M1 and M2 expressions, meromorphic expressions, and we uh, can, of course, for any meromorphic expression, we can try to evaluate phi on M1. It might be undefined, because even if we go into a division ring, into a skew field, we might just get zero somewhere. But what this thing says, that if M1, if phi M1 and phi M2 Defined and M1 and M2 are equivalent expressions, then phi of M1 is equal to phi of M2. So in other words, equivalent, what this means, that this is the universal Q field of fractions, expressions that are equivalent, that ca cannot be distinguished by mapping at least into anything uh, reasonable. If you want to map into something unreasonable, like algebra of bounded linear operators in the dimensional Hilbert space, then you know, if you do such things, you are at your own risk. Okay, another way to say it is that if we take a matrix F, uh, F and N by N matrix, over O our ring then we can look at the rank of this matrix and by rank I mean inner rank we take uh, factorizations and we can, can type the kind of the smaller size that we can factor through so that's sometimes called inner rank. So that's purely algebraic object, right? It's purely over this ring. And then this is equal to what you get by evaluations. Uh, so this is the maximum of 1 over n rank. X, uh, uh, or all X in CN and D yeah, zero. You, you probably want to have the so yeah, points are X, X are N times N, which is I guess at some other size. I mean that N at Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, not the same end. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry. No, but, but that's fine, that end, the, yeah, this end is No, fine. no, no, I mean, this end is not the same end. Okay. So this is just matrix for yeah. We don't need it. So, it's obvious that there is an inequality, because, of course, if you factor this, then you factor the evaluation, so there is always a trivial inequality. The question is whether you really can test the algebraic rank by evaluations, and saying that you can is pretty much equivalent to saying that those evaluations gives you an equivalence relation that produces the universal skew field of fractions. Uh, Victor, you don't have to soup over n hmm? or for 
for n, so this one, oh, you're saying for every n? Uh, that, that's why that max is in front. So that max is you're over, maxing over n. Yeah, yeah. The, you're maxing yeah, over n. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you will reach it at some yeah. point, of course. Yeah. Uh, not maxing over the x, but over, over n. Well, over all axes and, all and all over all x. Yeah. Yeah. You certainly may have, to, I mean, in smaller sizes, you may have yeah. identities. Yeah, yeah, okay, I see, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just if you put the bracket at the end, Ah, uh, yeah. It is. Okay, sorry. Sorry. okay, no, no worries. I was parsing it too literally, yeah. Okay, uh, do I have negative time now? Uh, yeah, you're minus two. I'm minus two. Okay, so let me make it this minus two into minus four. Uh, so these are the scalar results. And uh, now we have also results in the matrix case, in the case of the matrix center, that go in a very different direction. So in the matrix case, uh, we started by trying to kind of play the same game, but then we realized that there is very little chance of embedding this. So of course, we still have this ring of germs around the matrix center, which can now be identified with those series with the matrix center, with these coefficients satisfying this in canonical intertwining conditions, two of which I wrote down here. Uh, we, we, we realize that this ring typically, in fact, we said that we can actually, that it's always the case, contains devices of zero. Uh, so, two of our main results in the matrix case is one that this, that if our, let's say, if our point is semi simple, so it's a direct sum of, our point Y is a direct sum of reducible points, so referring to Yuri's talk, there is no radical. Uh, in such a case, this ring always contained, the ring of analytic germs at the point Y always contain new totems of order 2. Uh, that's one uh, main result. The other main result is how is this ring of power series related to the free to the to the free algebra? So in the in the case of the scalar center, in the case of S equals one, uh, algebraically the ring of power series of formal power series is just algebraic completion of the free algebra. Uh, and I mean it's trivial, right? Because if you take uh, what it means that if you take formal power series, if you truncate it at every point. You still get a non-commutative polynomial. You still get a uh, non-commutative polynomial. And now this, of course, literally, if we try to do this construction in the matrix case, will fail because those conditions they c connect coefficient l and coefficient l plus one. So we have our series, and if we truncate it somewhere, uh, we will no longer get a series that satisfies those conditions. We will no longer get an NC function. However, what we have been able to prove is a mid type interpolation theorem, which tells you that if you have a bunch of, let's say, mutually non reducible points, or more generally, semi simple points that have no, no same, comp not the same component, the same direct sum doesn't show up, you can always construct an element in the free algebra that has given values of those points, and furthermore, given non-commutative derivatives, and the, of course, the non-commutative derivatives are not arbitrary, because they satisfy those conditions, so if you prescribe the first L of them, there will still be a shadow. It's an infinite sequence of conditions, but it projects to a certain finite sequence of conditions on the first L coefficients, but these are necessary and sufficient for polynomial interpolation. And what this means is that it's still true that the completion of the free algebra, the algebraic completion, with respect to the ideal of NC functions that vanish at this point, is still the whole ring of, I mean, if you take the algebraic completion, then you have to remove the before analytic. It's still the whole ring, local ring of NC functions. Uh, but, the, but the way you obtain you know, your algebraic approximation is more sophisticated. You have your power series, you truncate it at the 10th spot, and now you cannot put zeros from the 10th spot anywhere. But you can put 100 more coefficients and then zeros, so somehow you can 
infinite number of steps, you can go from the given coefficients to zero. You can kind of interpolate so that those uh, intertwining conditions are satisfied. And I'm really running out of time, so let me stop here. On the number of things that you have to do, like yeah. you have 10 and 100? So uh, well, 10 to 100 was just uh, to the first two numbers that I thought about. No, the, so the bound for, so for the, the remit interpolation, the bound is polynomial. It's polynomial. It's, uh, it's polynomial of fairly low degree. Uh, yeah, I think cubic or something like that. Yeah, yeah. it depends a little bit on, on the, yeah. we, how big are the points, but I try to yeah. interpolate that. Yeah. But it's, it's if you ask for order up to L, it's going to be, yeah. Yeah. So, so if you, you truncate and then you have to add terms and then you take the sequence of those, you know, that, that converges to the, the original function? Uh, yeah. Converges in, like, in, like, on in, some neighborhood? Yeah. On some neighborhood, yeah, because you know that the original series converged, uh, yeah, all converged, yeah. Any more questions? Okay. And we're on track for seven minutes. Yeah. yeah, well, I think that since I'm the last speaker, I think we should set thanks to the organizers. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, on behalf of the organizers, <laughs> I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, I want to thank the uh, all of you for showing such enthusiasm talks that were from areas very different from your area, asking all kinds of penetrating questions. So, uh, looks uh, new. This, uh, that first group reminds me slightly of a conference in Pablo, uh, Pablo and Mihai. I ordered, organized a day in 2005, and it was on some squares, and it brought together strange group of people who then actually carried on together, at least quite a few of them did. So hopefully uh, many of us will keep in contact in the future and something will come out of this that's unexpected. We have tea, and I'm not much ready tea, right? So. <laughs> in six minutes, everyone come back with tea and discussion, right? Everyone must I'm have not something. sure. Oh, do we need it? Yeah, we should have a. Yeah, do we? Have a, yeah, why don't we have a, a preliminary thought about the discussion? Yeah, I think we could do something. We could have a discussion, but that was kind of like we saw a blank spot on the paper. We put the discussion. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we should. Does someone have something that they would wish to discuss afterward? Is it, uh, and if there's not, we could discuss all, also over the tea. So, uh, so maybe maybe we don't have to come back and reassemble <laughs> unless somebody's got something they want to present. Why don't we just go have our tea? <laughs>